What's up, Real Life family? We are so grateful for the opportunity to worship with you today. We're excited because we know that all it takes is one encounter with God to change your whole life, and we believe that day could be today. We would love it if you would share this experience. Click the share button or copy the link and send it to a friend. Also, be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay connected to your Real Life family. Well, it's about time to get started. Thanks again for joining us. Great to see everyone. I want to welcome our campuses and everybody online. And I'm going to wish you a happy Independence Day now in case we don't get to hang out on 4th of July. It's very possible some of us won't see each other that day. But happy Independence Day. Because listen, we have an amazing country that is founded on the principle of freedom. It's still fighting for freedom. Fighting, is, it gets messy, doesn't it? When you're fighting for freedom, it can be messy, and we're still fighting, and that fight looks different to different people in different seasons, but we thank God that this country exists, it's founded on freedom, and it's fighting for freedom for all people, and so thank you, Lord, for our country. I want to say that. And uh, okay, speaking of freedom, we have had, this is so incredible, I just asked uh, somebody recently, I'm like, it seems like we've had a lot of baptisms as a church and I just pressed in, and, and it was six months, you know, it was June 30th. The first six months of this year, we've had 266 baptisms as of June 30. That's amazing. Uh, you know, some of you aren't mathematically minded, so you haven't been able to do the math yet. That's more than one a day. That's about 1.5 a day. And it reminds me of what Luke decided he wanted to tell us in the book of Acts. He said, this is noteworthy that daily people are coming to Christ and so 2,000 years later, that's still true at real life. Every day, this church is open and working. Somebody is getting their life changed and they're getting closer to Christ. So we give you praise for that, God, for all the lives that are being changed. 266 in six months. We've already had a bunch today. So I'm excited, man. I'm just so excited about that. And uh, parable series. Parables, again, you might be new, just jumping in. Short stories with big meaning. Jesus tells these very brief stories about um, God, life, ourselves, to help us understand who we are and why we're here. And today he actually tells us a hard-hitting story called the parable of the rich fool. Ooh, the parable of the rich fool. If you think about that, essentially, just the title of that parable alone, essentially Jesus is saying, you can be rich and still be dumb. Do you know that's true? I heard one amen over there, okay. You can, Americans, do you have the internet? You can be rich and still be dumb, right? We see this every day. I actually just, this was funny. I heard that comedian Pete Davidson, this is what he shared with us. He said, yeah, I got high and I bought a Staten Island ferry for over $200,000 and now I don't know what to do with it. So I'm like, you can be rich and you can still be, he said, I'm still trying to figure out what to do with it. Then I found out that next month he has a movie coming out. He stars in, it's called Dumb Money. Go figure, there you go. So, hey, the parable, is that, that is sacred. It's of the Lord. The title is up for grabs. So I would like to just suggest, maybe we rename the parable of the rich fool, Dumb Money. Dumb Money, a parable of Jesus. Here we go. He says this. Okay, so it starts, remember the context is important, not just the content. But someone in the crowd, as Jesus is teaching, says to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns. I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. 
then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? Jesus ends the parable with this point. He says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Whew. That's a heavy, he, he prepared for everything except the most important thing. Uh, I was thinking a couple years ago about this hunting trip that I was on. Every, every year, my oldest son, Noah, and I, we go on a hunting trip, father and son, and we go, um, a couple, last couple years have been Kentucky. And so a couple years ago, we went up to Kentucky and he hunts with a bow, I hunt with a crossbow because we like to get up close and personal with the action. You know, like it's, it's a little more challenging. It, it gives him a fair chance because the guy's like Robin Hood. He never misses, it's crazy. And I would hunt with a bow, but I'm older and I don't trust myself and I don't like to lose. So anyway, I got a crossbow, he's got a bow. We go to Kentucky and my friend, he, he says, hey, I don't know if you'd ever be interested in this, but I have a private family farm up in Kentucky, a couple hundred acres. Nobody in my family really hunts or anything. So like, if you'd ever wanna come up there and hunt my private family farm that's infested with deer, I said, man, let me pray about that, yes. <laughs> I prayed in the spirit, it is done. I know I'm coming up there. So Noah and I were so excited that we get to go hunt the private family farm up in Kentucky. And, and so a lot, of, a lot of preparation though. Hunters know, if you don't know, you just think you kind of show up in the woods and you're like, oh, deer are running around and you're just shooting at them. It's not how it works. So I had to go up there twice to get ready for the trip that we were taking. I go up and I track deer is the first one. I want to figure out what their patterns are. Where are they crossing rivers and um, where are their little... Uh, their little lines through the forest. And so I figured out their roots. And, and then, then you wanna put up your tree stands. If you're bow hunting, especially, you gotta have a place to kind of stash yourself and hide. You might put a food plot, cameras to kind of track and get you excited. So a lot of preparation went into this. I was up there two different times, getting everything set up. And now we're here. We're all set up and ready. And it's actually, it's the last night of the trip. It's the last sit. We're in the stand. Noah already has meat in the cooler. Dad is waiting on that big buck because he knows how the Lord works, right? He's like, they that wait upon the Lord shall get the biggest deer. So I'm waiting on this thing, but it's the last chance that I got. We got a couple of hours left and I'm in the stand and I'm praying, I'm ready for action. And it's, it's now dusk, what I call deer 30. If, you're ne if you've never been in the woods, you don't know that all of a sudden the woods, they shut off at a certain point and everything gets quiet. The squirrels stop flittering about and the birds stop squawking and everything gets dead silent. And that's usually what happens right before you hear the first crunch of the leaf under the foot of the big buck. So I was all excited, man. It was deer 30, I'm ready to go, I'm prayed up. I'm like not even breathing because I'm just dead silent and I'm waiting. I know this is my night and all of a sudden I hear this huge noise off in the distance about 100, 150 yards away. And I'm thinking maybe it's a big buck. But the noise keeps going on, and, and as it, it starts to get clear, I realize it's a guy and his dog out in the woods. I'm like, no, this is gonna ruin my hunt. And, and so I'm trying to figure out what they're doing out here. This is private property. I've been invited. I'm the only one that's supposed to be out here. So I start to text my friend, what's going on? You know, somebody's on your property. As I'm trying to figure it out, all of a sudden I hear, boom, shotgun blast through the woods. And I'm like, uh-oh. And then I hear him yell to his dog, go get him, boy. And I'm like, what in the movie deliverance is happening right now? I'm out in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky. There's shotguns being blasted and there's dogs running. I'm like, this might not end well. Noah's texting me. He's like, who is that? And I'm thinking, I got my son out there. Is he getting shot at? So I was like, I don't know. But whoever it is, uh, they're either trespassing or they think we're trespassing and because they don't know that we're here. They're also the ones with the gun. So that's another problem. As we're trying to figure it out and we're texting, all of a sudden I hear a second blast. Boom, and this one is aimed right at me. You can, I won't ask for a show of hands how many people have been shot at, because um, a lot of you are from the Northeast, so we just assume you have been. Um, but you know the difference between a gun being shot and a gun being shot at you. You can hear the difference. And so this one I knew, I was like, oh. And then you can hear the pellets ripping through the trees in the forest. And I'm like, it's coming right up. So it just covered my head and it was like, Ksh! and then just got, just got rained on by, by that bird shot. And I'm like, okay, I'm okay. You know, you feel, and you're like, you look around, Lord, no, okay, I'm still here. But uh, I, I had to yell at that point. I'm like, I don't want to get shot for, you know, I'm like, I'm up in the tree. Please leave. You've ruined my hunt. I'm from Florida. I'm giving him my address. I'm just like, I don't want to die. 
That was my, the guy took off. I never even met him or saw him. It was, that was it. That was the very abrupt end to my hunting trip in Kentucky. It started with me hunting and it ended with me being hunted. That's how it went. I was like, wow, that was a very interesting turn of events. Um, it turns out later on, I found out it was an extended family member. He was just training his dog for duck season. So he was, yep, shooting and having his dog run. Didn't know we were up there. But if you're ever in nowhere, Kentucky, and you happen to run into old Jonas Buckman, ask him about the time he shot that pastor from Florida. And I'm sure he'll have a good laugh for you. Anyway, so, you know, it turns out you, you can prepare for a lot of things. You can't prepare for everything. And there are some things that you can't prepare for everything. There's some things if you're not prepared, it will cost you, right? It doesn't end well if you're not ready. And, and so you go back to the parable. This guy in Jesus' parable planned for everything except the one thing that mattered most. He had a plan. He had provision. He made all the right preparations. But in his preparations, he, he missed the point. He made preparations, but he missed the point. He, he had provision, but he missed his purpose. And he had planned for everything except the most important thing. He was prepared for anything except the most inevitable thing. And that is meeting God. And it happened, you know, Hebrews 9.27, it says, it's appointed for man once to die, then comes the judgment. Every person's gonna die and then be judged by God. That's the order. That's the two-step thing that's gonna happen. You're gonna die, you're gonna face judgment. You're gonna meet, you're gonna meet the Lord. That's the inevitable reality awaiting all of us. Are we ready for that day? Are we working backwards from that fact that's coming? You know, this guy was prepared for everything except the most important thing, and it doesn't end well. There are some things when you're not prepared for it, it doesn't end well. And I, I'm, you know, as I read this story, I, I'm struck by how American this parable is. This is the most American parable I think we have in the Bible. The American dream, by the way, we call it the American dream, but it was around before America. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, property, if you're an originalist. It was originally property, but I know we don't teach things in school anymore, so there you go. That one was free. It's not in the Bible, but you need it. Life, liberty, the pursuit of property became the pursuit of happiness. It's the thing everybody wants. Just I just want to get something for me. I want to take care of myself. The American dream was around way before America, and this guy was living it. He had it going on, man. He, he, he was doing the thing that we all want to do. The American dream, basically for us in our country, you work as hard as you can to get as much as you can so that you can do as little as you can, right? Retirement's the big goal for all of us in America. Um, I recently hit a milestone birthday. Uh, I won't tell you which one because I already told you and I don't like to talk about it, but at a certain birthday, they start sending you materials, letting you know that you've arrived you know, they start sending you little cards and you're like, oh, cool, you get badges, you can walk into McDonald's. People jump out of their chairs and say, you sit, sir. You know, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> but, but like the American dream, the whole goal is you, you work as hard as you can to get as much as you can so you can do as little as you can. And then retirement is the dream. Then we retire and we're like, I finally made it. I'm at the age where I can sit and look out my window all day and get annoyed with my neighbors. Whew, we are here, baby, you know, like, what is that guy? He has a motor's lawn in four days. Retirement, you know, where I can finally drive around in my golf cart and, and talk about the weather, play pickleball, drive extremely slow on Lakeshore. If that was for somebody, that was the Lord, not I. He's just trying to, it should only take me seven minutes to get to church and it takes 11 and you're the reason God bless you. But I'm, but you're retired. You did it. Good for you. You don't have to worry about me. You worked as hard as you could to get as much as you could so you could do as little as you possibly can. But, but my question is, and I think Jesus' question is like, then what? Then what? So if that's the dream, I mean, is it really a big, like, are you ready for what really matters? Because you can plan and prepare for everything except the most important thing, and that is to meet God it, you may be ready to retire, but are you ready to expire? Because that's going to happen. It is appointed for man once to die, then comes the judgment. And Jesus, he's telling us the story. He said, you could have everything and really have nothing, no matter how well we do down here. Someday we're going to meet God. And on that day, all the stuff that used to matter isn't going to matter anymore. I mean, just like that. We'll be like, oh. You know, when you sit down with God on the final day, 
and, and you meet him face to face, it's gonna be a beautiful thing. There's gonna be a reckoning and accounting of our lives and as we sit before him, those of us who are in Christ, we thank God there's no condemnation, but, but we're going to see our lives and we're going to sit before him, right? And so we have this meeting with God. Um, it's appointed for man once to die, then comes the judgment. But what God's not gonna ask for on that day is like, uh, I'm gonna need to see your bank statements. I'm gonna need to see all your accounts. It's not an IRS audit, right? He's not gonna be like, uh, what, how many real estate holdings did you have? Did you know your property at this address was worth this much? Oh, no, thank you, okay. Uh, and I see here that you drove a late model car. Good for you, you made it, all right. Um, you were doing really well. Guy before you had a Tesla. I was really impressed. It's just like nothing we thought mattered on that day is gonna matter. He's not gonna judge me based on what I had. Man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions is what Jesus says. He's not gonna judge me on what I had, but he is going to hold me accountable for what I did with what I had, right? Life isn't about, that, that's the point, that life isn't about what you have, it's about what are you doing with what you have. This guy made the plan, but he missed the point. He, he was prepared, but he had no purpose. And in Luke 12, 21, Jesus says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. And I wanna keep reading because you get more of the context of what Jesus is teaching. If we, if we keep reading past the parable, he says this, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or your body about what you'll wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn. He's, he's referring to the parable. This guy had it all and because they don't do that. And yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying could add a single hour to your life? Since you can't do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow's thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you'll eat or drink. Don't worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things. Your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom and all these things will be given to you as well. I love the tone of this, check this out. It's so warm, it's so kind, it's so personal. I don't know how you picture God, but these are the red letters from his son. This is what he said, he said, don't be afraid, little flock, for your father. It, I just see him right now, if he was talking to us, addressing our church. Little flock, I love you guys, man, just don't be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I, I love the way this parable continues, the teaching here, because there's so much comfort. I bet a lot of us came here today worried about a lot of things. And Jesus says, don't worry about those things. They seem so important, they're, they're not as important as you think they are. In the grand scheme of eternity, it's not gonna matter as much as you think it does. And the stuff you're worried about, God's working on. Trust him. You don't need to worry, you just need to trust your father is crazy about you and he's working for your good and for his glory. And so he's like, don't worry, guys, don't worry. He's got an eye on you, he's taking care of you. There's comfort in this passage. If you came in here today worried about the stuff of life and your job and your business and, and, and your career and your promotion and your finances and your bills, and you, he's like, I got you, I got you. I'm crazy about you, I care about you, and I'm taking care of you. So much comfort. But there's also conviction. There's comfort, but there's conviction because he's like, but where's your treasure? Because you can store up treasure here or there, where's your treasure? And he challenges us to think about, are we rich towards God? Are we making deposits in heaven? Or are we all about down here? Don't worry about this life. There's more to this life than this life. But are you living for the next life? Are you investing? He says, where your, where your uh, treasure is, what happens? There will your heart be also, right? Treasure and heart go together. Where you're invested is where you'll be connected. 
You got any stocks right now? You guys have stocks? You, you, you got some stocks? What happens? You, you watch your stocks, don't you? Because you're invested, so you're connected. You want to know, is it going well? Is it going bad? Um, where your heart is. You, you may coach Little League. And if you coach your kids Little League, it's like, you better step up, son. You better play because I'm out here every day coaching your team. I'm invested. I'm, I'm connected where I'm invested. He says where your treasure is. But where are you invested? Where's your time going? Where's the talent that God gave you being invested? Where's the treasure that he's entrusted you being put and used? Investment and connection go together. You know, that I think the guy in this story, he had a problem, but it's not the problem he thought he had. A lot of times we'll have a problem. It's not the problem he thought his problem was. I got more stuff than I got space. The problem he's trying to solve is I got so much stuff and I don't have enough space, which is, by the way, that's a pretty American problem, isn't it? I've been many other places in the world. And, you know, when I was in Nepal, for example, you know, nobody was talking about storage units. No, nobody was like, when I was in the outer villages of India preaching over there, I was like, nobody was like, yeah, that's a good point. Let me, meet me at my storage unit and uh, I'll show you what I, it's just not a, like a very American problem is I have more stuff than I have space. I did some research. Uh, the self-storage industry in America is an $80 billion industry. There are 55,000 storage facilities in our country not units, facilities. That's, you passed seven of them on your way to church today. That's if you live next door. Isn't it crazy? Like every time they're building something new in town, you're like, oh, that's probably good. Nope, that's a storage unit. Yeah, because we have more stuff than we have space. That's the problem we think we have. We have so much stuff that we no only have uh, houses for us, but we have to rent apartments for our junk. That's the problem the guy in the parable has. He's, he's been so blessed. You know, it's, it's the problem he thinks he has. He actually has a much bigger problem. His real problem is he's not ready to meet God. He, he, he got good at the game, but he got good at the wrong game. And it's like Jesus warns us. He says, what good would it be if somebody gains the whole world, loses their soul? If you're not ready for that day, you can win in everything in this life, but if you lose in the next, you know, our days are numbered. None of us by worrying can even add a single hour. Jesus just told us that. He already knows when our job is to be ready when our time is up. This guy was ready to retire, but he wasn't ready to expire and meet God. And God calls him a fool. You fool, you made, you made the plan, but you missed the point. Luke 12, verse 15 it says a man's life, this was the context for the parable. He just says, a man's life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed because life isn't about getting ahead. It's about getting to heaven. Does that make sense? I'm gonna say that again because some things you're supposed to write down, okay? This is one, if this does not show up on Instagram, you're fired. I'm telling you, life is not about getting ahead. It's about getting to heaven. That's the difference. A man's life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. It's not about getting ahead. It's about getting to heaven. And he has made a way for all of us to do that. It's not about getting more stuff. It's about getting to know God and being rich towards him. It's not about how much can I get for me. It's about how much can I do for him. And so often our problem is we're busy making money when we should be making a difference. We're busy making a name for ourselves when we should be making his name known. And with the limited time, talent, and treasure that we have while we're here, what are we doing with it? You can't take it with you, but you can use it for him. You can store up treasure in heaven and put it on deposit with God. And when you meet God, listen, instead of him saying, you fool, you'll hear him say, well done, you faithful servant. Wouldn't that be cool? When I meet God, I'd much rather him say, well done, good and faithful servant, then call me a fool because I made a plan, but I missed the whole point. This week I had a, I had a cool experience because I got to spend some time with some of our partners. I don't know if um, you know about the partner program at Real Life. It's a beautiful thing. We have uh, particularly a lot of our seniors, again, people who have retired from their businesses and careers have time to give at the church. So someone who works at the church as a volunteer for 10 or more hours a week 
we consider a partner and we have a program for the partners. And these people are such a blessing because they, a lot of times they have great experience and a lot of knowledge and they're able to use that here to build up our church. So the person who runs that program is a gentleman named Tom Freed. He actually has a table in the lobby this weekend because I said, hey, I'm gonna be talking about you this weekend. You gotta go connect with people. But he came here and when he came to this church, he had this vision of helping people prepare to live their life for Christ. Not just do as much as you can to get as much as you can so you can do as little as you can, but all that God's invested and poured into you, what's his return on investment for the rest of your life? So he teaches a class on that here and he also runs the partner program. So he, he had a meeting where I could just kind of say thank you and meet, meet the team. But before I could say thank you to any of them, it was crazy because each one of them just kept telling me their story and kept thanking me for the opportunity to serve here how meaningful it's been to them, how many people uh, they've met and, and the way that God's used them to make a difference and how it's fulfilled them and just kept saying, thank you so much. And I'm like, you're the one working here for free. Thank you, right? Like, I don't know if you run a business, but when you get people to work there for free, you're like, thank you, Jesus. Like just the tax bill on you alone would have been a lot. I mean, plus the benefits. Anyway, you know, you see the spreadsheets, man. Thank you, my partners, I love them. And one in particular jumped out this week. I, um, I got to talk to Cindy. And Cindy helps with our baptism teams here, which again, 266 in six months, let's go. God is awesome, but her team's been pretty busy. And so I'm like, man, how is she able to give so much time? She's been really busy and baptizing so many people. She's actually an assistant manager at a local bank. So you wouldn't expect that she'd have time to give, but she makes time and she gives it. And so Cindy's telling me her experience, and I, I don't know, if you ever had this, you go into a church and the people that like have the name tags and the shirts and are smiling, you pretty much figure they got, their life's okay. <laughs> go, okay, I, you know, be nice. That, look at them, look at that smile, look at that name tag. They must be doing something right. And, and you make assumptions, and it's so funny to hear Cindy's story because like that's, I see her and I'm like, man, this lady's just giving so much. But she's had it rough, and she's been through a lot, and she was telling me her story, and through tears, just, she said, I ne this was very insightful to me. She said, I came here and I just sort of wanted to hide in the corner after all I'd been through. And I never, you would even preach about it, I never saw myself as the kind of person that God could use to do anything. And she said, and now that he's using me to make a difference, like she said, I just want that for everybody that goes here. I was like, that's such a cool thing. Like I'm thinking, that's what it means to be rich towards God. And, and so she's, her heart is not only full, but her account in heaven is filling up. And listen, Cindy's a banker, okay? She gets it. She knows how this thing works. She knows deposits and withdrawals. She's a banker, but she's not banking on this life. She's storing up for the next life. And so I, I'm excited about our partner program. If that's something that maybe excites you or interests you, even, even if you, it's not time yet, but someday it might be, go talk to Tom in the lobby here in Claremont. He'll be at the other campuses soon too. Better watch out. Tom's coming. Makes me think though, like it's, it's what I said earlier, life isn't about what you have, but it is about what you do with what you have. And this guy in the parable actually had a lot. And that's not a bad thing. We don't have to be guilty about our, sometimes God blesses us. He had a great run. God blessed him. The problem wasn't the blessing. It's what he did with the blessing or didn't do. Because he, he didn't have a plan to help others. He didn't have a plan to give back, to tithe, to honor God with the first fruits. He didn't have a plan to change lives. He had a plan to get the blessing and he had a plan to store the blessing. He didn't have a plan to be the blessing. And, and we're, we're blessed to be a blessing. That's the whole purpose. We're not, we're not supposed to be a dam where this thing just stops with us, but we're supposed to be a river and it runs through us to others. We're blessed to be a blessing. It's not about what you have, it's about what you do with what you have. As you think about this parable and how it speaks to your own life right now, because when I read these things, I know I end up teaching them to you, but I'm reading them and I'm going, what are you saying to me? Lord, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm hearing your story and it feels like it's for me every time. And I know a lot of you feel the same way, but Jesus is just challenging us to think about, you know, most of us spend most of our lives focused on all the wrong things. So set your mind on things above, not on things below on earth. Set your hearts and minds on things above. So are, are you using what he's given you for his glory? It, even if it all worked out in the end and you won in this life, are you gonna win in the next? 
Are you making the most of what he's entrusted with you? Are you, are you maybe caught up like most people trying to get rich in this world? Or have you figured out how to be rich towards God? Living to make money? Are you, you here to make a difference? Are you here to make a name for yourself? Or are you here to make his name known? Are you living in light of eternity? Or do you think you got all the time in the world? I know something that, as I read this parable, I just thought, man, Lord, if I meet you today, at the end of, we don't know. Days are numbered, don't know how or when. If I meet you today, would you say, well done, good and faithful servant? Those are the words I wanna hear. Or would you say, you fool, where am I missing it? You know, and I, I hate to be morbid, but most of you probably know this, um, you're gonna die at some point. Some of you are like, no, AI, they're starting to clone. I think I'm gonna be good, man. Yeah, some version of you will still exist on the internet, but no, we're all gonna die. The mortality rate for humans currently is right about 100%. Did some research. Crazy. I mean, there was like, there's Methuselah and Elijah got picked up by a fiery chariot, UFO. Anyway, so I don't know how God's coming to get you, but your time is coming. My time is coming. The question is, is just, am I going to be ready when that day comes? If, if I'm not here at the return of Christ, then, then I'm going to expire. And maybe I have a plan to retire. Do I have a plan to expire? Because when it's over, it's over. There's no second chances. There's no redos. There's no reprioritizing or coming back and fixing things. It's, it's done. Am I ready for that day? Because whether you're ready or not, it's coming. And I, I think most of us listening to this message today, we're going through stuff. I talk to very few people that aren't dealing with intense things, difficult things, struggles. Some of us, it's like a low-grade fever. It's there, and we're trying to function, but we know in the back of our mind, and it's in our subconscious. We feel it in our stomach that I know this, I'm waiting for this to happen, and, and that still isn't right. And some of us, it's right in our face, and we wake up, and we can't help but think about it. Um, some of us, it's very intense. It's very immediate. But I wonder if the punchline might be the same for all of us, that maybe God's trying to help us let go of this world in some form so that we can start preparing for the next one. Some of the heartbreaks, some of the heartaches and the losses and the kicks and the punches that we take, they might actually be a blessing in disguise because the truth is this world's not our home. And until we get that, we're gonna keep trying to make this world our home. And so all these little things are here to remind us that this ain't it. Because even if you whack this mole and get this right, what good is it if you gain the whole world but you forfeit your soul? Uh, earlier this year, my wife lost her dad, my father-in-law, Jim, amazing guy. And it was just a really tough time. It's been a tough season of loss. But it's actually caused Robin to read up a lot on heaven and what God has planned for us and what Jesus has promised us. She's been studying, it's been building her faith and she keeps sharing things with me. And, and what was grief and loss has really turned into anticipation and excitement and hope. And you know, we grieve, but not as those who have no hope, the Bible says. We, we mourn differently than the world because we have something. And she, those, somebody asked me the other day, they said, you know, with, um, you know, I know Robin lost her dad, how's she doing? I said, honestly, she's doing really well. And I said, oh, why do you think that is? I said, because I, I think she believes all the things that we say. And they're like, what? I'm like, I, I haven't met too many people who do, but I know my wife does. She believes the things we teach and read and, and, and because she knows it's real, it changes her reality. I wonder if God isn't allowing some things in each of our lives, not to break us, but to make us more like him. Not to punish us, but to prepare us for his return. Sometimes our woes are just there because they're teaching us to not worry. You're so worried about this and that, and these woes have to come. Because at some point, don't you get to a place where you are, what do we call it? You're stressed out. You ever been stressed out? Not stressed up. All y'all stressed up. I've seen you parking. I'm just saying, I'm not talking about stressed up. I'm talking stressed out. When you finally get to the breaking point, where I can't worry about one more thing, so I'm just gonna stop. I wonder if some of our woes are there to teach us to stop worrying, to let go, because we can't. can't. I've been trying to control, and you've been trying to get me to trust. Lord, I'm letting go. You know, I, when Jesus comes back, this is interesting. It's either gonna be, it's either gonna feel like a divorce or a honeymoon. Think about that. 
We're either going to be ripped away from this world that we love or we're going to be run into the Lord that we love. It's either going to feel like a divorce or a honeymoon. That marriage he talks about, that wedding feast, we're either excited for it or we're going to be mourning that the thing we love has been ripped away. John in 1 John 2, he says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Because everything in the world, he says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, I have this and I do that. And it comes not from the Father, but the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. That's the promise that's in this parable. And we can hold on to it and claim it. Don't be the rich fool and make plans, but miss the whole point. Be ready, be rich towards God and ready for Christ's return. Here are two things about Christ's return. It's gonna, it's gonna be sooner than you think, and it's gonna be better than you ever imagined. Be ready. Stop clinging to the stuff of this world and start storing up treasure in heaven. Let me pray for us. God, thank you. Thank you, first of all, that this world is not our home, that there's more to this life than this life. And as there are things happening in each of our lives that feel bad in the moment, we know that they are preparing for us a glory that far outweighs them all. So thank you. But I pray, God, that you would give us a spirit of diligence and vigilance that we would be ready for your return, that we would not be storing up and winning a game that's only a losing proposition, that we would win but at the right game. This, this fool, you called him, he, he had the plan, but he missed the point. And I pray that we would get the point that it's about you, that everything we have is from you, and it will all return to you. Lord, help us to bring you a return on your investment in our lives. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, to be known and be loved. And Lord, I thank you that most of all, we can be ready. We can be ready for your return by receiving your love and your grace that you showed us through Jesus on the cross. It won't be our righteousness and our works, but it will be our readiness in Christ. Help us to accept the free gift of your grace. So when you return, we won't be ripped away from this world, but we'll be running to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for Real Life Online. We hope this video encouraged you. As part of our Real Life family, we want you to know that we are here for you. If you need prayer or would like to get connected to any of the resources we mentioned, you can find it all at real.life slash connect. And if you'd like to stay up to date with what God is doing here at Real Life and always know when we go live, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also find links to our website and other Real Life resources available for you in the description area below. Thanks so much for spending part of your day with us. We want you to know that God loves you, we love you, and we'll see you next time.